You good see? All right. Good morning. Welcome to Life Family Church. We welcome you here today in Blue Earth, and we welcome you um, on Facebook Live. So, uh, before I get started, I'd like you to, um, yeah. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. You know, we put these videos up on YouTube, and people must watch these videos and be like, boy, they're really down to earth there at Life Family Church in Blue Earth. So if you're watching us on YouTube, then all I can say is you miss out when you're not here in person, because we are a lively group, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so we're going to be continuing in the Backbone Chronicles today. If you have your Bible, you will want to pull that out. Um, and I will, be, uh, I will be reading out of the Bible today. And uh, I read out of the Bible every week, just in case anybody's wondering if they're joining us for the first time. Uh, but uh, I want to encourage you uh, that if you're going to follow along in your Bible, we're going to be looking mostly at the book of Numbers and the book of Joshua. So you can get those out right now. The num numbers, we're going to start in 13. And Joshua, we're going to look at chapter 14. All right? So here we go. All right. So I want you to pray with me that God is going to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. If you're a young person here today and you're following along with your, with your paper, if you... Um, if you can't read or spell, if you draw a picture of me preaching, that's good. But if you're over seven years old and you can read or spell, I would like you to uh, write down the scripture references, and I'd like you to um, at least make enough notes that I can tell you're paying attention. Then should you show that to me at the end, you can make your way over to the prize box and pick something incredible that will change your life. Okay? All right. So pray with me. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this day. Your word says that this is the day the Lord has made. So we will rejoice and be glad in it. God, I thank you for every person that's sitting here with me today. And I thank you for every person within the sound of my voice, every person that's watching, every person that's that's turning, tuning in right now, Father God. I ask you for all of us collectively, according to the book of Ephesians, for the spirit of of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you as we open the word this morning. God, I thank you that your word is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. That this is not just ink on paper. This isn't just a cool story. That, that these were real people and that the spirit of God is going to empower us today to be changed on the inside by the word of God. And I thank you, Lord God, that everybody here is in agreement with this. And so everybody says in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Good morning. So if you've been with us in the Backbone Chronicles, we have been, um, we started off with welcome to the invertebrate zoo. And if you were not here for that, or if you've missed any of these, you might want to find us on Facebook Live and go back into the church Facebook and find them and watch. Or you might want to get on the YouTube channel and, uh, and watch them because even though they're individual stories, uh, collectively we're seeing, a, we're seeing a thread. And so it's really important that we as a church family that we hear and speak the same thing because you know we're one man, right? We're one body. And so as we do that, it's important that we're hearing the same thing. So, who remembers the, uh, the definition, uh, young people, I know you old people do, uh, elder. So, who remembers the definition of an invertebrate? Lindsay! Oh, um, uh, yeah, no backbone. No backbone, that's right. Very good. Give that girl some, yeah! All right, good job. Well, that's because I caught you off guard. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, an invertebrate has no backbone, no what? Spine. So, if you have a book, this is a book, if you have a book, what is this part called? Spine. That's the spine of the book, right, Chuck? Right, Chuck? Chuck? Sky? <laughs> That's the spine of the book. And the spine of the book is what holds it together and keeps it stable, right? So, you, everybody take your, take your hand and go and touch your spine. How many of you, your, your spine felt like jelly? 
You may touch the spine of someone next to you, but you have to ask first, okay? I don't feel it. You don't feel your spine? Let someone else feel it for you. It's hard, isn't it? I can't feel it. It's there. If you can stand up and sit up, it's there. So your spine is what is inside of you that holds you up and makes you to stand or to sit straight. Your spine is the reason you can go from one place to another. If you didn't have a spine, you would be like a jellyfish. Remember we talked about jellyfish? Noah, what do jellyfish do? Uh, they wash up on shore. They wash up on shore. What else, Sky? Oh, they sting you, yes, but that's not really part of <laughs> being an invertebrate. But I don't like jellyfish because they do sting you. Uh, they're pretty. They're pretty. They can be pretty. But when it comes to being able to decide where they go, jellyfish don't really have that ability. They are washed back and forth, back and forth with the ocean tide. And many, many times they end up on the shore just laying there. And some, somebody, like me, has to come along with a stick and toss them back into the ocean. Why? Because they have no spine. They cannot get up and walk away. And because the ocean has a current, it'll take them and move them back and forth and back and forth, right? So, we don't want to be spiritual jellyfish, correct? We want to have some spine. So, we've been looking at people in the Bible with backbone. All right. So the first one we looked at was who? Moses. That's right, Moses. And then the next one we looked at was somebody named Noah. Noah. Was it you? <laughs> no. no. All right. We looked at Noah. Then the next one we looked at was the one with all the the sound effects. It was um, Back to School Sunday. David. David. That's right. We looked at David. And and what did uh what did all the the uh, um, what did all the Philistines say? Ooh. 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 And what did all the, uh, the David and Saul say? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, good. So some people have been here. Okay. <laughs> and then we celebrated communion, the communion table two weeks ago. And then last week, who did we look at last week? Rahab. Rahab, Rahab the harlot. harlot. That's right. We looked at Rahab the harlot. And if you weren't here last week, uh, you probably should get online and and uh, check it out because we uh, we discovered some things about Rahab uh, and therefore discovered some things about ourselves, right? right? So today we're going to look at Caleb, okay? Everybody say Caleb. Caleb. Okay, if you Caleb. young people are taking notes, you probably want to make note that we're looking at Caleb today, okay? That's kind of important, all right? So I'm going to give you the meaning of his name, many, many commentaries say that the meaning of the name Caleb is dog. And so, can you think of good qualities about a dog? What are good qualities about a, you have a dog, what are good, good qualities about your dog? Um, Seth? Loyal. Loyal, very good. Sarah? Was that? They listen sometimes. They, they listen, they're obedient. Yeah, right. Mm. Sometimes, yes, not all of my dogs. Any good qualities about dogs? Anybody else wants to yell out? Companion. Smart. Loving. Companion. Loving. Loving. Funny. Loving. What? Adorable. Adorable. <laughs> I don't know that that's part of the meaning for Caleb. I haven't seen a picture of Caleb. I don't know if he was adorable. What did you say, Sky? Funny. Funny? Yeah. Okay. Funny and adorable may be on the outskirts of this meeting, but that's okay. So when we look at dog, we think of loyalty, faithfulness. A dog is whose best friend? Man. Man's best friend, that's right, okay? But if you look at the, what, what in, in uh, theological studies is called the cognate, okay? This word doesn't necessarily mean just dog. It means in in uh, it means in the original language raging with canine madness. Okay. Okay. Say raging. Raging. Okay. For for us here, particularly in southern Minnesota, raging is not really something that a lot of people do. Right. We're very calm here in Minnesota. We're very Minnesota nice. Right. We're pretty. Uh, we're pretty steady, Eddie, right? 
right? Yep. Just one. You're just, crazy, Justin. So. <laughs> just one little nod is all we give, right? So we're gonna look at a guy who is obviously not from Minnesota. Okay. This guy, uh, his name is Caleb, and his name means raging with canine madness. All right. So Caleb was the son of Jephunneh. And we're going to look at two specific accounts in Caleb's life. And uh, the first one is going to be the story of the spies in Numbers 13. Okay, and then we're going to look later on in his life at the result of that. All right, so two passages. So we're going to read that now. And then we're going to look at things that we gain from the life of Caleb. Are you ready? All right, so let's look at Numbers 13. Okay. Put our glasses on so we can read. <laughs> Obviously, I'm never going to be a famous televangelist. That's all right. All right. So we're going to start in Numbers 13. We're actually going to um, to read all of it. So it's going to be kind of quick. All right. So hold on. Let me just get to my spot. Okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourself men, so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader or prince among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, all of the men who were the heads of the sons of Israel. So these were their names, from the tribe of Reuben, Shammua, the son of Zachar. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. Now let me just give you a free piece of advice. If you are um, getting into your childbearing years and you want to choose names for your future children, here is a list for you, okay, to choose from. Okay, from the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Ilgal, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, or Joshua, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Rephu. From the tribe of Zebulon, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. From the tribe of Joseph, uh, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. And from the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali. You getting ideas? Hmm? Okay. <laughs> My future grandchildren. All right. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. Michael's nice. From the tribe of Nephtali, Nahabi, the son of Vophshi. Bofshi. From the tribe of Gad, Uel, the son of Maki. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. But Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is like, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. And how is the land in which they live? Is it good or is it bad? How are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? And how is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are the trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time for the first ripe grapes. So Moses is sending them in with a checklist. Okay, it's like a scavenger hunt. And he sends them in to this land to spy it out. All these from the, from the various tribes. So they went up and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, at Lebo Hamath. And when they had gone up to the Negev, they came to Hebron, where Ammon's, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. All these little details don't have a whole lot to do with the story but they're important. Then they came to the valley of Eskol, and from there they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the figs. The place was called the valley of Eskol because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down from there. Just so you know, uh, if you don't understand that because you don't know the language, the word Eskol actually means cluster or grouping. Okay. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. What did they bring? 
Young grapes. people, what did they bring back with them? Grapes. 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 And what else? Pomegranates. 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 And one other thing? Figs. Figs. Good. Glad you're all paying attention. Okay. All right. Just making sure. Okay. Thus they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us. Good. And it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev with the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. So the place was filled with ites. All right. All these ites that people were afraid of. They were large people. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Remember, this is raging, raging mad dog, right? He quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its, its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Boom. Okay, so we'll stop right there on that. So here we are uh, looking through the eyes of Caleb and looking through the eyes of the other spies. So Joshua and Caleb gave one report, and the other spies gave another report. Do you think the other spies lied? No. No. No, they didn't lie. The, the Anakim were there. The, the big guys were there. They were, but their perception is totally different than the perception of Caleb and Joshua, right? So now turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 14. Okay? Chapter 14, we're going to start at verse 6. And we're going to read a few verses, and then we're going to go to a few verses in 15, because there's lots of details. So, what you can do is you can take your notes home today, and you can read this whole account and get much more out of it than what we would in this one hour right here. Because it's actually a phenomenal story. Phenomenal story. Okay, so let's look at Joshua chapter 14 and start at verse 6. Ready? Then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, he is saying this to who? Joshua. Very good. Okay. You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me, in Kadesh Barney. Now, I will say we skipped that, so you're going to have to go back on your own time and read it, okay? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. Well, there's a, there's a point of interest we did not have, because it does not tell us in the book of Numbers how old everybody was that was sent to spy out the land. How old was Caleb? What did we just find out? He was? 40. 40. Okay, everybody. Is that old or young? Young. Oh, really? Young. <laughs> it's, I just wanted to hear everybody's take. There's no right or wrong answer. Right? Okay. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, say nevertheless. Nevertheless. Okay, just keeping you with me. My brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear, but I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trod shall be an inheritance to you and to your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God fully. 
That phrase there, we've already seen it twice. If you read through this whole account on your own, you will find it more. Okay? And remember, all of us Bible scholars, when God wants to emphasize something, what does he do? He repeats it, right? When he says, truly, truly, or if you have a King James Version, it'll say, verily, verily. Okay? He wants you to pay attention. When we see things repeated in the Bible, it's for emphasis. All right? And now behold... The Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 45 years. Okay, math wizards. He went when he was 40 and he said he's let me live 45 years. How old is he now? 85. 85. Woo, good job. All right. From the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, then Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am 85 years old today. Might have actually been his birthday. I don't know. He said, I am 85 years old today. Happy birthday, Mad Dog. Okay? <laughs> I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now. This is a confident man. For war and for going out and for coming in. In other words, he's still got, he's still got it going on. He's like... Come on, Joshua, look at the gun show. See what I have going on here. I am still 40 physically. Hmm. Okay. Now then, he's still speaking to Joshua. Give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him, and that means to speak well to him and of him, and gave him Hebron the, to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, until this day, because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. And then lastly, I want you to look at uh, chapter 15 here. And we're going to look at verses 13 through 16. Okay? And like I said, you need to go home and read all of this together. Now he gave to Caleb, this is Joshua, he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kiriath Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron. And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Shishai and Aman and Talmai, the children of Anak. Then he went up from there against the inhabitants of Deber. Now the name of Deber formerly was Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, the one who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I'll give him Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. So he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as a wife. And we'll just stop there. Okay. So this is a basic uh, Reader's Digest version of the story of Caleb, the story of the spies, and, and Caleb... The raging with canine madness uh, patriot. Okay? So we can learn things, and the Spirit of God can open our understanding to spiritual things that we can learn. So it is a cool story. Yes? Yeah. It is a cool story. There's all kinds of cool stuff in it. There's all kinds of stuff. Just his name is cool. Just finding out what this guy's name means. Because if you read, I read a lot of commentaries, you know, especially when I'm prepping for sermons about what people think. And many of the commentaries that I read about Caleb were Caleb's name means dog. And Caleb showed faithfulness and loyalty to Joshua. And that just sounded wonderful. And I thought, well, that's good. But then you read this other guy who actually knows the language a little better. And he says, in light of the cognate, the Syriac, and the Arabic words, the meaning is not just dog which is Caleb, K-E-L-E-B-H, but the meaning is raging with canine madness, which is C-H-A-L-E-B, like Caleb, Caleb. So we get a better understanding of this man. And then as you have that understanding and you start reading through the books of Numbers and Joshua, 
you see raging with canine madness coming out. You do see the loyalty. You do see the faithfulness because it says that he served his God how? Faithfully and holy, right? But we also see a raging madness. What 85-year-old man in the right mind would say, hey, I'm ready to get what's, get what's due me right now and I'm still as strong as I was when I was 40? <coughs> well, we'll see about that, Caleb. And off he goes. There are four things that I want us to gain today. So I'll open, open the eyes of our understanding today that we can get these four things. Because these are the four things that God put in my heart about Caleb. This man was a man that had spine. This man had backbone, yes? He wasn't weak. He wasn't wimpy. The Bible says he was a raging dog. He was a mad dog. Did you ever see a bulldog? They're ugly little things. Why? Because they're, they're, they're all smashed up here like this, right? Their, their noses are all smashed up like this. Why? Because they are made to grab a hold of something with their teeth and not let go. If you have a dog, like I have chihuahuas, okay? And they can grab a hold of something with their tiny little teeth and it will, it will poke tiny little holes like in your toes. They like to grab at your toes. The puppies, not the adults. <laughs> But anyway, when they grab a hold of something, their little nose, because of the way their little snout comes out, their little nose gets pressed up against there and they can't breathe, right? So they're going to let go. When you have a bulldog that grabs a hold of something, its nose is smashed up against its face and it can still breathe. And do you know that a bulldog or those dogs that have the noses pressed like that, that they can hold on to something uh, forever? Because they can keep on breathing. Because God made them that way. And God made Caleb to be a raging mad dog. Because he wanted him to grab a hold of something and not let go. So the first thing that we can gain from Caleb's life of spine is this. I would rather serve God full of raging with canine madness than just as a faithful, loyal dog. Okay? And maybe, you, maybe you're not like me, and that's okay. There's great virtue in faithfulness and loyalty. If you, if you have a dog, do you want an unfaithful, non-loyal dog? No. Like if you lived out where I live, and you had an, un, a, an unfaithful dog, an unloyal dog, uh, the first time you said, no, don't do that, he would just run away. And he would run away. Right? Loyalty is important. The, 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 the dog is a man's best friend, right? The Bible says about faithfulness, says a faithful man will be what? Blessed. Yeah. He'll be flooded with blessings. But I am here to tell you today that God wants us to be more than faithful. He wants us to be like Caleb. Amen. He wants us to be a raging mad dog when it comes to taking and appropriating the things of God and the things that belong to us. Amen? Amen? Because if we're not like that, and I don't mean you need to, you need to like snarl and growl, you know, and be ugly. You don't need to be like that. But in your spirit, you need to be a raging mad dog. You need to be so determined. I'm going to grab a hold of this because this belongs to me and I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. You know, there's, there's a spirit of apathy that has held the church of Jesus Christ down. But I'm here to tell you today, it's being removed. If you were, uh, if you were on the internet or on TV yesterday and you watched um, this, the, the return, did anybody see it? I know a couple of you did. Uh, it was a time of, of national repentance on the, the National Mall in Washington, D.C., in front of the White House. And... Um, I'm telling you, the spirit of apathy is being lifted from the church. It's being removed from the church. There are many, 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 many millions of believers in, the, in this nation today that are very sweet, very kind, very faithful, and very loyal. But God wants to take us to a different level in that and turn us into raging mad dogs when it comes to the things of God. He wants to do that. 
Yesterday, the White House estimated, they put out their own estimate, because if you look at the mainstream media, they will tell you there were like 600 people there. But if you listen to the estimate of the White House and you look at the, you look at the video shots and you look at the, the aerial shots, yesterday they estimated there were 75,000 to 100,000 people on the National Mall repenting for the sins of the nation, repenting for abortion, repenting for sexual promiscuity and perversion and homosexuality, repenting for the sins against the native uh, Americans that were here, repenting for uh, the spirit of division that we have allowed in the church, repenting for racism, repenting for all these things that are sins in this nation, and then crying out to God afterwards for a revival. Do you know that you can be sweet and kind and loyal and faithful and never see revival? We have to have the spirit of Caleb. We have to have that Spirit of, of, uh, of uh, canine man, raging canine madness. Isn't that what it said? Raging with canine madness. We need to have that about us. That doesn't mean we need to be angry people. The canine madness, that's, um, that doesn't mean that the dog was angry. That means the dog is going to grab a hold and not let go. Right? It's not rabies. All right? Jeremiah 20, verse 9 says, uh, If I don't speak it, it becomes a fire shut up in my bones. And the prophet said there, If I'm not able to release what's on the inside of me, it will drive me to the point where I feel like I'm on fire inside and it has to come out. That's my translation for you today. All right? <laughs> so number one, I'd rather serve God full of raging with canine madness than just as a faithful dog. Okay? And maybe you don't agree with me, but that's okay. Number two, speaking out the truth will many times make you unpopular. And I know we've had this a couple times with some of the other uh, backbone believers, some of the other people that we've uh, looked at in the backbone chronicles. Uh, many times, speaking out the truth makes you unpopular. If, uh, I'm going to read to you from Numbers 14.10. So this is, um, this is when they were sharing Joshua, or Hoshea, Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh were sharing their report as contrasted to the other ten spies. Okay? It says here, Numbers 14.10, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes in other words, they were distraught at what they were hearing the other spies saying. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good. Otherwise, why would God tell them to go look at it if it was nasty and junky, right? If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Totally different than what you were hearing from the other side. Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But verse 10. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. In other words, God showed up and stopped the stoning. So these people were listening to what Joshua and Caleb were saying, and they were sharing the truth. Here's mad dog Caleb saying, God is with us, and he's already removed the protection from them, and surely we are going to be able to go in and receive this good land that God has given us. We can do this with God. And what did the people say? Uh, we're going to kill you. We don't like what you're saying. Eh, stand still, we're going to throw stones at you until you're dead. That's what they said. That's what they said. So speaking out the truth will many times make you unpopular. But it's okay. What happened after people said they were going to stone them? It said the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. So everybody that was planning on doing the stoning and the, and the people that were brave enough to tell the truth and then the wimpies 
that, that gave the, what the Bible calls a bad report and made the people shake with fear. Every single person experienced the glory of God and the presence of God at that time. Every single one. Luke 21 says, Before all these things, they'll lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. Why? Because of what you say. If you start declaring the truth, you're going to be, at times, unpopular. You're going to make an impact in people's lives. And, and, and many, will, many will be changed. But there will be some that will hate you. And Satan will be stirred up against you. And the Bible says they will, they will persecute you. But can I just say that the glory of the Lord will appear for you. Amen? Amen. So number two, speaking the truth will many times make you unpopular. Number three. I, everybody say I. 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 Yep, just making sure you're still awake. I must follow God fully with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, not holding anything back. And it will not just affect my life, but it will affect generations after me. Joshua 14, 13 says this, Then Joshua blessed Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. Therefore Hebron belongs to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, as an inheritance to this day. What's the next phrase say? Because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Caleb received what God promised, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. It does not give us any other reason. Yes, he was a mad dog. Yes, he said, hey, I'm 85 and I'm just as, as I was at 40. All these things. But it doesn't say that God gave it to him because of that. It says that God gave him the promise he made to him. Because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. And that, my friends, takes out every bit of me. And my goodness, and my skills, and my ability, and my giftings, all of it. My plans, my purposes, my pursuits, all of it. I need to wholly follow the Lord my God, so that the promises that he made to me will come to pass. You know, you hear people sometimes, oh, this is, I'll be gentle. Sometimes people say things like, well, God is in control. God is in control. But he is not in control of your free will. And sometimes people don't receive what God has promised to them because they feel like, oh, it must be God's will when it's explicitly in the word of God says what God's will is. This is God's will for you. Uh, I can think of uh, God above all things. I wish that you what? Prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And we take our experiences. How many of you have ever been sick? I've been sick a lot. Not, le not recently, but there was a time that I was so sick I couldn't walk. I was sick. And we take our experiences and we say, this must be God's will. And it's not true. And the promise of God is health. Amen? Amen. The promise of God is provision. Amen? The promise of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The promise of God is all through the Bible. And the Bible says that all of his promises amen. are yes and amen toward us. Who believe him. If we want to receive the promises that he's made, we need to follow him with our whole heart. Our whole heart. Now, if we're standing in a place today where we're not seeing everything, every single person in this room, every single person that's watching me, has not received every promise of God. We've not, we've not walked in the incredible fullness of the promises of God. And if you say you have, I don't believe you. <laughs> it's that simple. Because all of us 
have areas where we're challenged. All of us have areas where we're believing God. All of us have areas where we're being stretched. Not one person has received the fullness of the promises of God. But I want to encourage you today that we must follow God fully with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, not holding anything back. Caleb received the promise of God at 85 years old. That is not a young man, even in those days when they lived longer than us. That is not a young man. 85 is not a young man. And Caleb received the promise of God because why? Because he wholly followed the Lord. That's why. Numbers 14, 22 says, Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt, this is God speaking, and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. And the next verse says, But my servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit, and has followed me fully. I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. It will not just affect my life to follow my God fully. It will affect the generations after me. It is so important. And during this time, this period in history right now, I think more than many times in the past, right now, we see, like yesterday, we saw a national day of repentance. Why? Because God's people have not been following him fully. We have not been following him fully. None of us. And God is calling his people to a place of repentance from where they've been into a place of following him with our whole heart. Amen? Amen. I can tell you that uh, it, it's going to take a, a raging with mad dog, uh, canine dog spirit uh, for us to accomplish the things that God needs accomplished. You see these little, where are they? These little feet that I wear every day. These are a replica of baby feet at 10 weeks in the womb. And I have never, ever, ever thought the abortion was right. I grew up in a Catholic home. Of course, we thought abortion was wrong. And I came into the body of Christ. You know, we came into a relationship with God. Of course, I thought abortion was wrong. But of course, we kept having lots of babies. So obviously, I think abortion is wrong. Right? And I've always been pro-life. As probably you have been too. Right? Abortion is wrong. It's always wrong. At, at every instance, there's never, ever, ever, there's never uh, a good reason to kill an unborn child. Never. No matter what. But it took a move of God in my life to turn me into an abolitionist. And it took God speaking to me and actually showing the movie Unplanned to take me from being a pro-life, a nice pro-life believer. I was willing to help anybody. I'll adopt your baby. I'll give you money. I'll do whatever to help you. But to being an abolitionist to the point where I hate it so much. I despise it. And it's a scourge in this land. And I believe it's what's opened the door to every other perversion that we have. The despising of children so much that you kill them in the womb. The most vulnerable on the face of this earth. And the church has allowed it. We have allowed it because we're not abolitionists. We're not even activists. We're just pro-lifers. God, turn me into an abolitionist. Make me an activist of the highest degree. To cry out for the most vulnerable. And that, my friends, is what God said Caleb had. He had a mad dog spirit. I'm going to grab a hold of that. And I'm not going to let go until abortion is unthinkable in this nation. Amen? So that's number three. I must follow God fully with my whole heart. Amen? Last thing that I learned from Caleb. Number four. <laughs> I have not arrived. You may think that I have it all together. Well, maybe you think that I don't. But I have not arrived. And friends, neither have you. We are never, ever past the age of being a servant of God. Never. 
Now, there are times and seasons in our lives that come and go and change, but our servanthood and the opportunity for growth never, never leaves, never changes. So some of us in here are young, some of us in here are a little older, and some of us in here have reached the pinnacle of experience, right? But none of us, none of us are at the age where we should give up and stop fighting. An age where we know everything. Um, it's never too late to get on the road to your destiny. It's never too late. You've, you've, you may have missed opportunities, but you've not missed the boat. If you're sitting here, here, check this. Do you have this? Most of you. Yes? Okay, well then if you can't find it there, find it here, right? You have this? Is it still beating? Don't knock yourself out, but is it still? We didn't even pass out breath mints today. We usually do after worship. Um, is, do, you, do you feel breath? Are you alive? Yep. There's still hope. Not only is there still hope, but there's still something for you to do. There's still purpose. Because some people actually, they actually come to a place in their life where they feel like, well, and I've, I had somebody tell me this when we first took over this church. I remember it so, so much because it just struck me. And it's just a very prideful spirit. And some of us get it when we're older. Um, and God helped me to not get this way. But I, um, I was sharing my vision for, you know, the church and, and how excited I was to be here and what God was going to do and what God had shown me he wanted to do in Blue Earth and in this area and all these different things. And she said, oh, sweetie, that's awesome. She said, I used to feel like that too, but I've done my time. She said, now it's time for someone else to, uh, you know, to do theirs. So it's time for you to do yours. And I thought... Well, that's interesting. And I just kind of tucked it away. And every once in a while, you know, it's come back up. And I realize that is a prideful spirit that we can get. God help me and you to never get like that. To feel like, oh, I did my time. And I'm done now. And now it's time for someone else to do the work or however you want to put it. You know, I have a, a cousin... And he's a man of God. He's a pastor, actually, in, uh, in Maryland. He's a wonderful guy. And I don't think he's watching this, but Matt, if you are. Um, he's, he's a good bit younger than I am. Uh, I was the oldest granddaughter, so everybody kind of came along way after me. So I got married, and my cousins were all like this big running around at my wedding, you know. They're, they're all a good bit younger than me. Um, my sister and I were... The oldest, the oldest girls, and then after us came a whole bunch that were much younger, okay? But my cousin, uh, when we were getting ready to come here uh, to sell everything and move again, because we had done it several times over our adult life and taken kids and moved overseas and done crazy, crazy things. Um, so I guess people kind of come to expect it, right? But we were doing it again, and this time the mission field was Minnesota. Minnesota. And uh, people are like, you're crazy. It's cold there. I said, I know. Uh, but God is calling. And uh, we left our kids. We left the one that just started college. We took the, the baby and off we went. And he told me, sent me a message and he said, he said, cousin, I just want to tell you that I admire you for doing something like this at your age. <laughs> I want to tell you, we've been here, uh, it'll be eight years, January the 31st, that I've been here, and when I moved here, I was 51. Um, and uh, he, I, I loved the comment, uh, but it made me realize that the mindset that most people have is once you're 50, you really don't need to do that wild, crazy stuff anymore. That it was kind of expected of us when we were in our 30s, you know? And when we were in our 20s, we went on short trips. And then when we were in our 30s, we actually, you know, moved our... We, yeah, we were in our 30s, right? We moved our family over, yes, because we arrived on my birthday. My birthday seems to be significant when it comes to doing crazy things. And moving across, <laughs> across the nation or across the ocean or whatever. Anyway, 
But at your age, to do something like that. Then when we were getting ready to adopt, you know, people, people said the same thing. I just really admire you guys at your age, being willing to do something like that. And you know, it, it, you know what age means? Age means that you're full of years. You have a lot of years. Years usually bring experience. But the mindset that we have of retirement is actually a cultural thing. Do you know it's man-made? So when we put that limit, what's, what's the Social Security age? What's the age you can, you can stop working and get Social Security? 62. 62. Woo-hoo! We're almost there. Right? Right. We are. <laughs> uh, so at 62, my government has told me that we can retire at 62. But that kind of mindset, if you're not careful, yeah, you can retire from your, your, the job that you go to and you work for the man or whatever, but if you're not careful, you can get that mindset about everything. Did Caleb have that mindset? No, absolutely not. And, if, and, and we need to make sure that we have the same mindset, that we say, I will do what God tells me to do with every bit of strength, with every bit of energy, with every bit of drive, with every bit of enthusiasm and zeal, as, as if I was 20 years old again, no matter how old I am. Because in God's eyes, we don't retire. We go from one season to another and one assignment to another, but that doesn't mean that we retire from the service of the Lord. Amen? We don't stop. Just refire. We need to make sure that we don't get the mindset that I'm coming to the end of what I have to do, and then it's smooth sailing from here. Do you know that in the natural, most people die within a couple years of retirement if they don't pick up some kind of something to keep them occupied? Dude, that should scare people at my age, right? Because we're getting close to that age. Do you know my daddy, who's probably watching, he was retired when he came to live with me, and he ended up going through a really hard divorce, and he was very, very lonely. And he was sitting around our house, just staring, and I, I felt like he was going to die from loneliness and boredom. And so we sent him forcefully down to the local um, senior center. And lo and behold, within a couple months, he's engaged. He was getting married. Woo! It's amazing. It's amazing what a wife will do. That's why the Bible says if you find a wife, you find a good thing, even when you're 75. Yeah. And I had the honor and the privilege of flying back to Delaware that first summer that I was here, because uh, he was going to move out here with us, but he didn't, because he was in love, and marrying that man to whom I consider my, my mom now, Sandy. And my dad gained years on his life yeah. from marrying that woman. He gained years on his life from marrying that precious woman. Why? Because when you find a wife, you find a good thing. So I'm going to finish up with this. Okay? The sons of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said to him, this is Joshua 14, you know that the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, right? And I was 40 years old when, the Mo when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to spy out the land, and I brought back an honest report. Okay, so skip down to verse 10. Now behold, as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive these 45 years since he spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Here I am today, 85 years old, still as strong as I was the day that Moses sent me out. As my strength was then, so it was, is now for war, for going out, for coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain. That the Lord promised me on that day. For you yourself heard that the Anakim were there with great and fortified cities. And with the Lord's help I'll drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Joshua chapter 15 verse 13 says this. According to the Lord's command, Joshua gave Caleb the son of Jephunneh a portion among the sons of Judah. Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. And Caleb, this is significant. Drove out from there the sons of Anak, the descendants of Shishay, 
Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak. Do you remember who they were? They were the ones that the Israelites said they were so scared of because they were so big. Here's Joshua. You would think that if, I'm sorry, here's Caleb. You would think that if Joshua gave him that <coughs> mountain, in our mindset in this day, that's our retirement home. Shoo, give me my mountain. I'm going to go put my rocker out there. I'm going to sit out there. I'm going to smoke my pipe. And I'm going to listen to country music because I am retired and received what God promised for me. What did he have to do to get the promise? He had to, he had to clear the place out of all the evil. And he had to fight. We are never, never done fighting. Amen? From there he marched against the inhabitants of Deber, formerly known as Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said to the man who strikes down Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I'll give my daughter Atza. So we see that he goes on to finish out and receive the promise of God. But receiving the promise of God did not mean that he was done. Well, now I can just sit on my blessed assurance and not do anything for the rest of my days. But isn't that how we feel? Okay, when I'm done with this assignment, I'm retiring. Like, I will be very, very honest with you. When, when he got struck with the, whatever this was, I thought, well, maybe it's time for us to retire. He's, kind of, he's older than me. So I said, you know, maybe it's time for us to retire from pastoring. You know, maybe we're done this and, and it's time to retire. And the Lord said, no, no. And he also said, you haven't ever received the promise. And today we are. We're receiving it every single day. And I'm here to tell you, my friends, it's not time to retire for me, for him, or for you. We're not done. We have more to go. We have more to receive. We have more to experience. Until the final breath, I'm not going to sit around and wait to die. I'm not going to have the retirement attitude that we have in our culture of now I'm finally done my life's work and I can sit and be sedentary and not do anything. And people have that attitude spiritually too. Do you know that we can, as a church, we can have that attitude? Do you know that if we do that, we'll be like just about every other church in this area? Do you know that? We can be a really nice little church. Or we can be a church full of mad dog canines that go after everything that God has for us. Yeah. Amen? We can affect the schools. We can affect the foster kids. We can affect the community. We can affect where we work. But we cannot affect anything if we feel like being a nice, friendly little church is enough. It's not. We need to be a Caleb. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So that's, that's what I have to say, and I'm sticking to it. That's my, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Would you stand up, please, so we can finish? And then you can turn it off. Who's a raging canine mad dog today? Everybody's like, <laughs> honestly, I pastor a church of warriors. I know you. I know. I know you. You're warriors. And God has so much more for us, my friends. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for raging canine mad dogs to take over the kingdom of God. That we would be like bulldogs and grab a hold of what you have for us with such tenacity that we will never let it go, ever. I thank you that we grab every opportunity with such zeal and such uh, power, Lord God, that there is no pulling it away from us and no releasing it because of weariness, no releasing it because of giving up, no releasing it because of 
of um, a mindset that is wrong. I thank you, Father, that your word says you renew our youth like the eagles. That's not just our bodies. It's our mind. It's our spirit. It's our soul. It's everything within us. And I ask you to do that today. If there are any of us in here that have been feeling old in the mind and worn out and worn down and ready to stop, I ask you, Father God, to rejuvenate us in the name of your Son. I thank you, Father, for the Word of God today. I thank you for what you have for this church and for us and for every single person that uh, is listening and watching. I thank you, Father, that your church will rise, O oh sleeper, and Christ will shine on us. And I thank you for that today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen and amen.